This is Hot Science with the week's top stories in science, technology, environment, and medicine. And it's hosted by me, Richard Clark. Welcome. So let me give a rundown of our stories for the week. Okay, here we are. Uh, the top story is an AI story, and it's beyond chat GPT. 14 mind-blowing AI tools everyone should be trying out now. In technology, there's a new design for a lithium air battery that could make much longer driving ranges compared with lithium ion batteries. It has four times the energy density of the lithium ion battery. And in the environment, CO2 emissions may be starting to plateau, says the global energy watchdog. And in uh, astronomy, more big bangs could be coming up, the scientists say. And in genetics, science make us scientists make a stunning discovery, find new protein activity in telomeres. And the human story, is the story you were talking about, Norman, a study of expats in a hehick. And Norman is joining us. And then the uh, medical story for the week is five key sleeping habits that can add years to your life. And these have been identified with scientists. So, hello there, Norman. And let me get on with this show. Now, uh, there is happening now this new breed of generative AI tools. And with these tools, AI has really become a technology that businesses and individuals can leverage to uh, significantly change the way they work and go about doing day-to-day uh, -day activities. I've started to use a number of these tools myself. And when we use the term AI now, we're usually referring to a technology known as machine learning. And this is uh, computer routines that can become better at, and better at carrying out one specific task as they are exposed to more data. And machine learning powers a lot of uh, the internet tools that uh, we're using now uh, searching for information online with Google, shopping with Amazon, and watching movies on Netflix all have these machine learning systems that are giving us our recommendations. So let me go through quickly this list of applications and say a few words about them as we go. If you have questions, as we're going, go ahead and ask while I'm talking about the tool. So we don't need to lay. The first one, of course, is chat GPT. And this is this what they call the large language model. And with chat GPT, you give it a text prop or instructions, and it will generate a uh, text and writing for you and it can do things like 
give you outlines and summaries and write material from scratch. So it's uh, pretty interesting. Uh, not all of the things it writes are based on fact. They talk about uh, hallucination because it can write as fact stuff that uh, you'd have to say is not well-sourced information. And it doesn't know, so it just treats it as fact. Then also from the same company is Dolly 2, and this is uh, something that takes test prompts and generates uh, images from it. And related to Dolly 2 is another program, Stable Diffusion 2, and so this is another text-to-image generator, and this is one where the company has done something very different than OpenAI has done. Uh, they have released their source code as well as details on the training data. And uh, so you can see how it creates the and deals with the algorithms. And it also can be downloaded and run on your own computer. Uh, whereas most of these others are available as uh, online tools. And they take so much power that you have to be running them on a big computer. Uh, with Stable Diffusion doing this as an open source tool, that's a very different path than the companies who are spending... Uh, millions of dollars each time they reprogram their AI tool and then finding out ways to charge users for it. So it's a very different model. Then another program, Lumen 5, and it is one of uh, what is going to be many different AI-powered video creation tool where you can easily create uh, education, marketing, or business videos using a simple drag and drop interface. Then we have SoundRaw, which is an automated music generator. So you can create royalty-free AI music. So you can get a music track in... It's original to you, and you don't have to pay for it. Then we have Luka, and Luka is an AI tool that uh, can create distinctive logos for your business. You know, you got to have a nice Luka, I guess, for it to make your company go. And I've looked at that, and it's... Uh, kind of amusing. The logos that I saw, none of them made me uh, stand up and salute it, though. Then we have another uh, product, Podcastle. And Podcastle is an uh, audio recording and editing platform. And with Podcast, you can create uh, clear, super smooth audio recordings that sound like they have been created by audio professionals. And then we have Gen 1, which is a cloud-based text-to-video platform, and you can create new videos from old ones that you load and give it text prompts and uh, change the video and edit the video that you upload. And you can also create animations from storyboard mockups. And this was developed by the creators of Stable Diffusion. So they already had uh, good tools for 
generating images and so they're using these tools for video production then you have lalai ai and it creates uh audio source separation which is really interesting to me it can extract elements such as vocals music or even specific instruments like drum beats or bass lines from audio tracks and i'm not sure how i would use it that sure is uh cool and it's a complicated product problem then we have deep nostalgia and this is for the people where you have uh your books of black and white photographs from your grandparents and you can it lets you animate the faces of these family photographs so you can see them smile and blink and laugh so it's to provide animation to still photographs and then there is murph and this is one of a number of text-to-speech applications it gives what they say is natural sounding synthetic uh, vocal recordings in 15 languages with a choice of over 100 voices and dialect and this automates the process of creation creating narration and voiceovers and if you're making videos like this where before you had to write a script give it to talent who did the recording and then make your video this makes the video production process much easier and much faster and of course you don't have to pay the voice actors then there is the legal robot and you know these legal agreements are hard to read and understand and legal robot is an ai tool where you can put the legal agreement in and it can explain it to you in ordinary language so how's that and then there is cleanup dot pictures and this ai tool lets you retouch your images by removing unwanted objects or defects or even people i guess uh you know john divorced mary so let's just take him out of all the family pictures okay then there is fireflies and fireflies is uh plugs into things like zoom where we're using here and it will automate the process of taking notes and creating transcripts the other thing it does which i think is interesting i would have to see it in action to understand it but it also analyzes conversations to provide insights into the dynamics and decision making process hmm. okay and then the last one is crisp which is another conference calling application and this just removes background noise and echo and stuff like this that get in the way so it's another kind of advanced audio processing tool to give you uh cleaner audio so that is just the list for this week uh these applications are coming fast and furious so we will next week's list would be a different week any comment about any of this stuff it sounds like that forbes article is an excellent excellent guide to starting to to uh, use it 
Yes, it is. is Very and, good. And so far, I've tried some of the things. I've tried some of the video editing tools. Uh, so far, I can't find exactly what I need for me. And so I am I do better with a human editing tool. Uh, what I've been looking for, though, is, you know, they talk about content uh automation video up automation one of the things that i think i will be able to figure out how to do is to get a system where i can give it a video recording or even a still photograph of my face and then it can create a, a 3d avatar of me and uh, then it can animate that avatar so I could give it a script of like one of the meditation things that I do. And then it can just record that script. It could have me wearing whatever I want to wear. I could be in whatever background I want to be, of course. I could put a music track in it from one of these things if I want. And so... For people who are creating content, it gives, uh, I can certainly imagine that it could give a way to create, uh, you know, high quality content pretty quickly, you know, just from your desktop. And, uh, you know, one of the things I'm doing now in with this spiritual stuff is I'm uh doing a lot of work uh creating and editing and posting video productions i probably do uh more than 10 a week and uh if i had some way to do that quicker and faster then that would be interesting and I know they're doing a lot of this stuff. You need it for company sales and marketing efforts. And, uh, you know, one of the things I did see going through is a video tool that basically lets you do a uh, custom video email message where everybody who gets it gets a message just customized for them. Mm -hmm. Well, and I did you, I saw did you... I saw a uh, piece on de aging actors that they can uh, make the actors the G I the A I sure and make the act look somewhat younger or older if you need an old one. You know, sometimes you need an oldie. Maybe this will take the wind out of the plastic surgery uh, industry. Nah. No, God, at, they're, they're at, le at least, at least for social media, yes. That's right. Yeah. That's right. But it doesn't help it when they you finally see your hero face to face, and he doesn't look like anything you see. Well, the uh, I don't think any of them do now, anyway. But. Uh, I noticed that that chat GPT uh, will uh, put output in poetry. So, Richard, you could have your uh, hotmail videos have you sounding like Muhammad Ali with That's everything right. uh, That's coming right. back. As yes, I last week I used a uh, hot science poem that was written by chat GPT. And was it any good? Well, uh, you'd have to ask somebody else. Oh, yeah. Well, the other thing that's probably going to happen is these things will be uh, as common as electronic calculators, and everyone will just have to know how to use them, just like right. we use a calculator. Right. And certainly one of the things I noticed is, uh, for me, it really changes my creative process, you know, because... Typically, uh, what I have is there's something from some uh, book that I want to talk about more. And so I can tell the chat GPT to act like an expert on that subject and then 
for example, I uh, ask it to explain some phrase and it'll give a good explanation. And if I want more, I can tell it to expand it and, uh, you know, then work with the content that it's giving. And so for me, what this does is it gives me an easy way to get an initial draft where I have something that kind of deals with what I want to talk about for then for me to uh, go and rewrite and apply the special humid knowledge that only I have. And uh, it ends up where, you know, this is stuff I do every week and I'm able to do it where, uh, the production side of it is a lot less and it gives me more time to actually think about what I'm doing. So I hope that means it's better. No, that's great. And even just generating an outline. Uh huh. Uh, tremendously useful. Right. And for example, you can, uh, give it, uh, through a uh, another tool that will extract uh, the transcripts out of YouTube videos, you can basically tell it, give me a summary of this YouTube video without ever watching the video. It's going to do to thinking what the typewriter did to penmanship. Uh huh. I hope. Well, my I hope my thinking doesn't get as sloppy as my handwriting. So you scare me with that comment, Andrew. You're probably right. Okay. I, I didn't mean for you, Richard. I meant just for the general. Run of the mill. <laughs> well, I first, before I think about the general, I think about it for me, and I have to say you're probably right. Now, as I use these tools, my wife still looks at me suspicious, like, just because of what you're saying. <laughs> so, okay. So let me move on. And, uh, the next story is a battery story. And this is a new design, and it's a lithium air battery, which has a lot higher power density. Uh, in the article, they talk about it. It'll provide a much longer driving range. So, uh, you know, here you could have your uh tesla or equivalent that has a thousand mile driving range instead of a 250 or 300 mile driving range i think it will end up being used they didn't talk about it but uh this means for most people they don't need a thousand mile driving range if they had a good reliable 200 mile range that takes care of their daily needs and if they have a smaller battery, since the battery is so much of the cost, then it's going to be a lower cost EV. So I think that's one, the way that this technology will be used. It also then could power uh, air, aircraft because the problem we have with the lithium ion batteries is they don't have enough power density to get it. And it also could be used for long haul trucks. They both have needs for greater power density. And what they have done here is this battery, the first part of it is they use a solid electrolyte instead of the usual liquid electrolyte. And batteries with solid electrolytes don't have the overheating and fire problem that uh, exists on the liquid electrolyte. So it has a safety improvement. And then the reason 
that it gets the uh, increased power density is because of uh, detail with uh, the solid electrolyte. They are able to make it using lithium oxide, and it turns out lithium oxide involves four electrons, not just one electron, like the lithium ion does. And that's why it has four times the energy density, because basically each atom stores four electrons instead of one electron. And uh, if you look at the structure of it, uh, the here, let me see if I can find it. Excuse me. Here we, it's the structure of it is simple. You have a anode and a cathode uh, with the uh, lithium oxide sandwiched in between it. You don't need the additional layer uh, for the uh, negative stuff because it gets that directly from the oxygen from the air. We're here, let me see if, if you compare this with uh, the lithium ion battery, you can see that it has fewer layers. So it's going to be uh, simpler to make. And the material that it uses is uh, for the electrolyte is a basically inexpensive ceramic material. So it's going to end up being inexpensive. And they've already operated it in a test environment for more than a thousand cycles and been able to demonstrate its stability over repeated charge discharge cycles. And uh, I think this is a technology that uh, will change what is possible out of the battery environments. So again, getting uh, what they will end up with is a system where they are able to get 1,200 watt hours per kilogram of battery. And so that is an enormous improvement. Comments on the batteries? You're muted, Norman. I thought the solid state batteries had an issue with uh, dimensional changes, but apparently this is not the case. Certainly, I didn't see anything uh, within it. You mean changing when they uh, get hot or something? when they get charged that they kind of inflate. Okay, okay. But the uh, cathode production seems to be critical for lithium ion or lithium air. Yes. And that's what uh, Musk is more focused on is the uh, uh, cathode. Uh-huh. Well, again, it's still uh, these battery systems we still are exploring our way uh, through them. And, you know, the fact that they are basically going to be used on almost everything coming up means that there's a giant market for good solutions. So all the companies are pouring money into R&D in the area. And... Uh, you know, I think we're going to end up finding the battery market is going to fragment and there are uh, different solutions with different uh, attributes and cost points for the different kind of needs. One thing I yeah, did... 
I'm sorry. Lithium ion does not lithium ion does not satisfy all requirements, like you That's say right. for aircraft. That's right. And one of the things I read about that I thought was actually kind of cute was a a company getting into the solid state battery business where they uh th their production process is 3D printing. So that means they can make the battery in whatever shape or form factor you're making you need. And again, it's one of these solid state batteries. So I don't know anything about the battery technology they're using, but I bet they're getting more power density than you have out of the lithium ions. But again, I just don't know. Okay. So now moving along the environmental story uh, says that CO2 emissions may be starting to plateau. And uh, in 2022, uh, the increase from uh, CO2 from energy use went up just 1%. In 2021, it went up 6%. So the rate of increase is uh, going down. And this was, 22 was not an easy year for energy because people around the world had to figure out what to do with the change in the availability uh, because of Russian oil. And certainly we saw people like China and other places uh, putting more money into coal and coal production and coal power production. But uh, all of that stuff, instead of having like a 6% increase, they did the year before, it was only a 1% increase. And uh, the thing about it was this rate was below the level of economic growth rate. And this suggests that countries are starting to be successful at decoupling economic growth from emissions. You know, so again, if you're uh, growing your economy like this and you're only growing your emissions like this, then uh, it's a good sign. We'll see what it's like uh, for this year and maybe for 2023, we will see we actually have uh, changed the slope of the curve in a positive direction. Any comments? No, this well, is a tremendous, tremendous change to minimize the amount of methane natural gas being used uh -huh. is impressive. No, what a lot of the reduction is because of the switch to natural gas. And in the US, all the new power plants are coming on as combined cycle um, natural gas plants that have half the CO2 emissions of coal plants and coal plants are being retired because of the increased uh, regulatory uh, restrictions. Mm -hmm. So that's a lot of it. Mm -hmm. But the uh, uh, certainly another part of it that is significant is these massive increases that are continuing to happen around the world towards renewables and that stuff too. So it's you know certainly having cleaner fossil fuels is a big help. Well, if you look at the real numbers, though, uh, re renewables in the form of solar and wind are still a tiny, tiny fraction right. of the total power. Right, right. And uh, China right now has rolling blackouts because of their uh, inability to provide the electrical power they need. And they're putting new coal-fired plants on one a week. Uh, and they're also expanding uh, renewables, wind, and solar faster than anybody expected as well. So they're, 
I think China is going in an all of the above solution. Well, one of the things that isn't being considered is the aging demographic. And China right now is coming on to a real problem because they don't have enough young people to uh, operate their economy. Mm -hmm. uh, or And by 2030, they're going to be in a real uh, problem. Right. So it's, and it's the no, and right, uh, China is just one of many countries, including Russia, Germany, France, where the birth rate is below replacement. Right. Yep. Yeah. And this aging demographic means that as people age, they move out of this tax paying productive middle years into this pension demanding, uh, care demanding older years. And uh, we're going to see uh, tremendous changes. Uh, this business of global warming is going to be the least of our problems. So it's going to be a big difference. China, before this, by the end of the century, the product, the projections that I see show China's population basically cut in half of what it is now. And, and they'll all be in their 80s. So... Uh... so okay, so the next, next we have uh, a story that makes me feel kind of relieved and uh some astronomers are saying that uh more big bangs could be coming up and the universe may be doomed to a bang and contract cycle forever and so researchers suggest that dark energy you know, this stuff we can't find anywhere uh, is behind the accelerating expansion of the universe and that there's going to come a time where it simply switches on and off and will change and then lead to a big crunch. And the big crunch will then have another big bang and we'll get to go for another ride on the universal merry-go-round. And somehow, to me, this is more satisfying than a universe that just happened once. Because if it just happened once, you always ask, well, what was it before that once? And what is it after the once? And having just something that continues to recycle is makes me happier. And so here it says dark energy could lead to a big crunch and then another big bang again and rinse and repeat. And they do say, however, they're, while it's interesting, their dark energy model comes with some drawbacks. The biggest one that they identified was they had to put some artificial factor in, some fudge factor into their equations about dark energy to explain the current rate of the universe's expansion. So... Uh, people question what they're doing, but they're saying, however, that doesn't mean what we're doing is completely useless. It's going to provide maybe a new basis for looking at this stuff. And we will see. I will be relieved if we have a big crunch instead of just the universe peters out as it expands forever. i gives me a sense of relief. How about you guys? Well, the thing about uh, uh, astrophysics is these problems they have are that the mathematics they have don't explain some of the things they see. And it's not because uh, what they see is wrong, it's because mathematics are just a way of modeling 
right. uh, reality. The mathematics are not reality. So uh, we just need uh, different mathematics. And uh, there's infinitely more that we don't know than what we do know. So uh, we can all expect to see changes in the future. Well, that's right. It's those unknown unknowns that'll get you. Yeah. And mathematics are, uh, are oversold as an explainer of everything. Um, mathematics don't explain everything. Well, it's just like you said, it's a way of making a model. Okay. And models, the thing about the models is, you know, you learned with maps. Maps are not the reality. Okay, now we have a biology story that uh, looks like it could be interesting. And, you know, we have the telomeres on the genes, and they have been looking at telomeres uh, for some time, thinking that they have something to do with aging. And what they have seen is the telomeres turn gene activity on or off and those change over time the gene doesn't change but the way it expresses itself changes as the telomeres change and what they have found about the telomeres is besides the changing they knew about for they're getting longer or shorter the telomeres also are able to produce two small proteins. And one of these proteins is found elevated uh, with some kinds of cancer. And so they think this one of the things that this work will lead to is simple blood tests for these proteins that could uh, work as an evaluation screen for some kinds of cancer. And they also think that these tests could provide a measure of telomere health, which could be another way to look at our age. What they are thinking is that they're able to see from uh, these changes in the telomere, you see a uh, physical test that uh, may determine how old your body is that uh, gives better information than your chronological age. So, uh, you know, what they found when they're digging into it at the end of a telomere's DNA, DNA it loops back on itself to form a tiny circle and it hides its end. And this hiding of its end then blocks the chromosome to chromosome fusion that is the way the gene is doing the work. So when the cells divide, they're not able to make the changes that the could happen uh, otherwise. And when the cells divide, the thing they've known for a long time is telomeres shorten until finally they get so short that the cell can no longer divide properly and it dies. And so anyway, what they hope to do through this, besides finding a new way uh, to test for some illnesses, is the money-making product will be the genetic test that all of us can take to see how our genetic age is as opposed to our chronological age is. And if those tests are actually good, then being able to do this would maybe give them a tool where they could evaluate different kind of anti-aging strategies and have 
some way to see the results before all the participants in the study die. So again, a new measurement tool makes uh, different approaches to science possible. They should look at this in uh, naked mole rats and uh, bats and uh, birds that all live 10 times longer than mammals uh -huh. of similar weight and see uh -huh. what the telomere deal is in those uh, uh -huh. creatures. That's a good idea. I hope that uh, they can think of it there and they don't have to go visit you in Canada to ask the question. And if we're able to measure our uh, kind of physical age against our chronological age, we could have that many more birthdays as we uh, wind up our lives. That's right. Our, get our it crowd our 80 years into 50 years, like uh -huh. so many people who do. Well, again, uh, the other thing, there are uh, a number of medical IPOs that are going on now that are trying to develop uh, anti-aging strategies that are based on telomeres and doing things to roll back the genetic clock by making control changes to the telomeres. So uh, you're going to be hearing, continue to hear a lot about these over the next few years. And so I think, again, with all the research being done, if somebody develops a good tool uh, that can measure this stuff, then uh, they will naturally start to use that tool as another way to evaluate their therapies. Okay. So the next story is about us here at Lakeside. And this was the study that was announced at LCS uh, a week or so ago with a study done by the Guadalajara University, a two-year study of the people at Lakeside. And they found that the expat community here is old, highly educated, and not particularly wealthy. Uh, the highly educated, more than 40% of the people that they were in the study uh, recorded uh, having some postgraduate degree. And 40% of the population with a postgraduate degree is uh, pretty high. And they the average income around here, more than uh, two thirds of the community earn under 60,000 a year. The Lakeside expat community is very liberal and is a community of happy people who are engaged in their community, but not much with their Mexican neighbors. Uh, and they are not wealthy, but they are charitable. The expat community says they live here because of the weather, the security of the area, and a lot of people would laugh when you say, well, I'm living in Mexico because it's more secure, but I think that's what most of us feel here. And then the low cost of living and uh, love for the Mexican culture. And I think I share all of those things. And uh, the expat community here at Lakeside is about 20,000 people. I'd always wondered, I'd heard different numbers. And now uh, almost 90% of them are 61 years or older. That doesn't surprise anyone. What uh, two thirds of them are permanent residents. And 
uh, the population is only slightly female with 52% female. I thought because we have all these oldies and women's live longer than men, that it would be more female than it reported, but it said only 52% female. And uh, two thirds say they don't attend church and 62% said that they are either non-religious or atheists. And in terms of happiness, almost 80% say that they're happy as opposed to less than 50% of Americans. So we're a lot more happy than our, our gringo friends who stay living back home. So comments on us happy lakeside folk. Well, it's interesting, too, that 33% uh, are single, either divorced or widowed uh -huh. and single, it says. And so that suggests that a lot of people come down there really not as couples, but as individuals. But, uh, you know, what I, I see some of that, but I see a lot of the way that uh, people become single as they come down here married and uh their partner dies okay so the other th thing is this would be a significant uh um impact on the local economy because if there's twenty thousand people with an average income of thirty thousand dollars each that uh it's quite a bit of yep. local spending six hundred yep. million dollars a year right. in and the it local has, economy. It has driven up uh, housing prices and prices at the store and because of that uh, there are areas here that used to be a lot more Mexican than they are now because as places come up for uh, rental or sales they are uh, used to be Mexican and now they're gringo occupied well when you go into the grocery stores do you find that it's mostly gringos or is it uh, a mix of everybody shopping? It depends on uh, where you go. We live uh, in Chapala, which is more a Mexican town than uh, Hiyak is. And so when we go into the stores here, uh, it's still largely Mexican, but still some gringos. And on the street where I live, Probably half of the population are gringos. Do you have to speak Spanish when you go to the stores? Uh, I can survive. Mainly around here, you can survive pretty easily with limited, limited Spanish. And that's one of the reasons why it's attractive to expats, because you can survive without the other language. The fact that you can survive the, without the other language, though, uh, has an impact on one of the things they reported, which is uh, less than 20% of the people reported having uh, close relations with uh, local Mexicans. And if you can't speak the language, you're not going to have close relations. Part of it, too, would be that I would think the expats, for the most part, are retirees, where the Mexicans, for the most part, are working and have jobs. Right. And if you want to have a, a Mexican friend, he'd have to be another retiree. And you don't know, I suppose you don't run into those. Well, a lot of the sources of Mexican friends are... Uh, the people Workers. that many of us have working in our house, that yeah. we get to know them over time and they become people who are more than workers. They're people that we know and they're people who uh, become friends. The same thing uh, we found happened in India. Well, do you ever miss parts of India that you would uh, want to go back to India? Uh, I enjoyed it there. Uh, I don't think about going back because it's 
financially impossible, so it doesn't matter whether I'd like to go back or not. Um, the other thing that would be interesting would be the local food and uh, having the Mexican cuisine and Mexican restaurants and all well, that. Well, uh, that would be interesting if there were any Mexican places to eat around here. What do you think, Norman? <laughs> you know, what uh, most people uh, think of as Mexican food is Tex-Mex food, and that almost doesn't exist here. Oh, yeah. Or or Sonoran uh, Mexican food, which is more common in the West Coast of the U.S. But if you look at Ahihi after 10 o'clock at night, you see lots of taco stands and so forth. Uh, there's right. a lot of Mexican food. It's just most of us don't go to the senatorias and most of us don't uh, dine on tacos after after nine or ten o'clock. Right. As I know what he's saying, a lot of the Mexican food is street food. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, the you can tell the Mexicans are real comfortable eating in that situation. And the other thing about street food is it's cheaper because you don't have to pay the overhead of uh, the fancy establishment. Or the big tips. And also the other thing from street food is, again, this is the culture is largely a culture of families. And uh, the street food, every uh, purveyor is a different family. And uh, the food basically is the food that their grandma used to make and uh, is flavored the way grandma would do it. And, you know, so it's also, I think, a part of this kind of family con culture that just pervades, is pervasive around here. Well, you better make it sound not too attractive or everyone who sees your videos is going to be moving down and uh... that's right it's terrible we can't stand it we're all just <laughs> waiting to get out i i had a friend who wrote newspaper articles sending the articles to hometown newspapers of of expats who moved here and finally he decided that was a terrible thing to be doing uh-huh making it be attractive here. Well, uh, the fellow who wrote the article, this Heffernan fellow, is he somebody who lives in your community? Or is I he an know. outsider? Oh, of course, if there's 20,000 of them, you're not going to know everyone. No. Anyway, so moving on, and... Uh, the one thing I'll say about that particular article is the place that it was published didn't let you either print the article or uh, copy the article. And so to get the print out of the article, uh, what I had to do was go where you can examine the coding on the web page find the part of it where they were uh, had the actual information in the article, uh, cut that out, and then put it in G chat GPT and said, said, read this HTML code and write it out in uh, English text. And so that worked. That's amazing. But otherwise, uh, you know, it was going to be hard for me to read it and make the copy that I worked from to talk to to talk to you guys about. Well, the royalty police are going to be on your front step. That's right. Tomorrow. Well, that's right. I'm not afraid of them. They don't speak English. Hopefully, the royalty police will be asleep. That's right. 
Well, do you see police cars driving around with police oh, yes. in them? Yes, and, and uh, here uh, they have the bubble machines on when they're just driving around. And so that, set that's an in interesting issue because that just alerts the bad guys that the police are coming. That's right, so they can go hide. And since I live kind of near the center of the town on next to one of the main streets, then uh, all night long, I see uh, these uh, official vehicles with uh, their bubble machines on lighting up the night. But where you live, you're two blocks away from the state police depot. That's right. Christiania Park. Yes. Where they have 10 or more state police trucks. That's right. And those guys who look beefy and tough. So we feel quite safe, actually. Well, does anyone talk about the drug problem or the drug cartels? Or is that non-existent? It's not much of an issue around here. Uh, they are in the state of Jalisco, but they're not much here at Lakeside. They tried coming in, what, about 10 years ago or something, and they drew so much action from the federales that uh, they left. And I well, think I, I think the federales think that these two hundred thousand gringos spending sixty thousand dollars a month each are too important to the economy to mess with. Uh, so they wanted to get the cartels to leave. And and the real money's in San Francisco or Los Angeles or places like that. So that's probably where the cartels want to control things. Or or in Puerto Vallarta. Yeah. Or, yeah. Right. Okay, so uh, the last story for today is a health story, and I'll go through it quickly. These are five sleeping habits that can add years to your life that have been clearly identified with... Uh, by the scientists. And what the scientists found uh, is if uh, for people who have all five of these sleep qualities, then for men, their life expectancy was almost five years greater. For women, it was only two and a half years greater. I don't know why the difference between men and women is. They don't know either, and they're looking at it, though. And uh, keep pay attention to these five sleep habits and mentally check them off on your list. The first of them are seven or eight hours sleep per night. Okay, I got that. The second is difficulty falling asleep no more than twice a week. Okay, I have that. I fall asleep pretty well. Trouble staying asleep no more than twice a week. Well, I still more than twice a week wake up at one or two o'clock and have trouble getting back to sleep. So I don't know if that one's the case. Not using any sleep medication. I don't use sleep medication and then feeling well rested when you wake up at least five days a week. I do that too. So I think I score at least on four of the five. And uh, they say you really have to have restful sleep. So it's not just sleep, but it's restful sleep and not have much trouble falling asleep and staying asleep. And what the research team found further when they crunched the numbers is that those who had all five were 30% less likely to die over some specific period of the study. 
21% less likely to die from cardiovascular disease and 40% less likely to die from causes other than heart disease or cancer. So uh, there's a real positive connection to uh, sleep well means that you live well. So how's your guys sleep anyway? Good? Mine, mine's not so good, but I think uh, this report it confuses correlation and causation. There's no uh, explanation of how sleep sure. would uh, reduce these factors. And it could be that naturally healthy people just sleep easier and sleep better and live longer. Could be. And, and it's not so much to do with the sleep as just their uh, genetic... Uh, uh, well, situation. Yeah, anyway, that's the problem with any of these population studies is all they're going to do is uh, give you data and maybe they can correlate two pieces of data. But like you say, that correlation is not causation and they have to do more to find out. What you can get from these studies, though, is they can identify areas specifically that you need to study more. Yeah, and then they can look for a hypothesis that would explain the causation. Uh huh. Uh -huh. And then figure out some way to test it. Okay. Well, I think uh, Norman and I score pretty well on this. How did you score? Uh, you're muted, Andrew. I, I get about one out of five. Okay, that's why you wanted to poo-poo the study. I understand. Yeah, I, okay. I don't want to die early. Okay. I, <laughs> I have heard of that. I, I don't use any sleep medication, but I, uh -huh. have trouble, I have trouble getting to sleep, and I uh -huh. wake up in the night and can't get back to sleep. And so you have trouble staying asleep. Okay. Yeah. The best way I find to sleep is to take a steering wheel to bed with me. And if I'm behind the steering wheel, I can fall asleep <laughs> like crazy. So there I'm is not, treatment available. Yeah. yeah it's so not, I'm, not, it's not, I'm not sure I believe you. It's not medication. It's an appliance rather than <laughs> Okay. Well, that's okay then. Anyway, that's what we have for this week. And as always, uh, thank you. And I appreciate that you're here and we're able to be together and talk about this stuff. So thank yeah, you. I, I forward your uh, uh, links to others continuously, Richard, because they are so good. Oh, very thank good. You. Very good. Thank you. Anyway. Adios, Fred. Yeah, if you're forwarding the Guardian ones, always include a cautionary cover to say that it's overhyped media nonsense. <laughs> uh, we only have to say that if we're sending it to right-wing hacks. Yeah. Anyway, see you all. And I appreciate uh, that uh, you're with us, Andrew. Uh in spite of my being a uh, lefty, is the most polite way I can say it. Yeah. Well, that's so what I they think. they call these uh, environmentalists uh, watermelons. Have you heard that expression? No, it's I haven't. Green on the outside, red on the inside. Ah, okay, okay, <laughs> that's a good one. Yeah. Anyway, adios, and we'll see you next week. Yeah.